Hi, thanks for joining us with this webinar about stopping blame and punishment. I'm Marcus Miller. I'm a VP here at Taproot, also in the sales department, and a strategic advisor to some of our clients. Uh, unfortunately, when there are investigations, sometimes we do see blame and punishment during and after investigations. So how do we get away from that? How do we get away from blame and punishment and get a clear understanding of the reasons why people break the rules or break policy and procedures? It typically isn't because they're intentionally trying to hurt someone or hurt their company. Circumstances probably just lined up against them that day and they were just trying to get the job done. They were making conscious decisions, improvising, because they had to to get the job done. Well, sometimes they're even rewarded for that behavior. Like, hey, you got it done, you faced all these obstacles, and you still found a way to get the job done, attaboy. But then sometimes they improvise or they make decisions, and other safeguards fail, and it leads to an incident. And now, all of a sudden, we find ourselves punishing people that we were just rewarding. So, we want to get away from that. I want to give you some knowledge, a tool that will help you analyze why people are breaking the rules and how to instead motivate the desired behaviors you'd like to see out of them. So let's get to it. First, very simply, how do we define discipline? Well, the dictionary defines it as punishing or penalizing for the sake of enforcing obedience and perfecting moral character. That's a really pleasant thought, isn't it? So based on that definition, it's fair to say we use discipline when employees don't follow the rules so we can teach them a lesson. Usually an incident occurs. That's that first green circle you see on the slide. And then we start an investigation. And then the investigators find out who does what wrong, what, what happened. And then people sit around the table and they start talking about passing out blame or discipline to the person that made the mistake and then everyone gets comfortable and they think the problem's addressed. And then we have an incident happen again. We have a repeat incident and it seems like we're all surprised, but should we be? So it seems like most organizations are fine with this because this is typical. And yet again, surprise when it happens again. So that really causes a lot of frustration. And the next person who makes the mistake will probably be even more unfairly punished and treated more harshly to, to set another example. But yet, I guarantee it, if we don't change our systems, that mistake's gonna happen again. Somebody else in that same situation is gonna make the mistake. If we don't take the opportunity to improve our systems instead of blaming people and punishing people, we will have repeat incidents. So we're gonna have to try again. So when does it make sense to discipline? Immediately after an incident, during an investigation, when you find out who did exactly what wrong, so we jump on it really quickly, or after we complete an investigation? Well, of course, we're all probably going to say C. We need to understand what's going to, what happened before we start really talking about what our corrective actions are, if it includes discipline. But you need to know more than that. You need to know why it's happening. And you need to know why, because you have to be able to explain that to your upper management, to people who make the decisions, so they give you the time and resources to fully understand what happened and then what the appropriate action, uh, corrective actions are uh, before you get into blame or discipline. So when I wanted to know the answer to that why question, where did I go? Well, I went to Mark Paradise. Mark is one of the best people I've ever known with the skill of answering your questions with another question. He's always teaching. So when I asked where should I start looking for answers, he asked me, where do you think you should look? And that answer is usually our taproot books. So I started reviewing and it became very apparent very quickly that the answers were on the back of our taproot tree. So it's amazing how I aged 40 years and he hasn't aged a day, right? Makes me sick. Uh, but more specifically, under management systems is where those answers are. Right here are the reasons people break the rules. Tapper gives us a framework for seizing all the opportunities to improve our systems so they support our people before we unfairly blame and punish them, putting our company at risk. And what do I mean by risk? Well, it's important to stop blame and punishment during and after your investigations for a variety of reasons. If you're familiar with Lost in Space, 
You should be hearing Danger Will Robinson when we start discussing blame and punishment without fully conducting a taproot investigation or root cause analysis. So some of the dangers was blaming people, one or more individuals, is really counterproductive, right? And it runs the risk of alienating your workforce and undermining your culture. Another risk is you're gonna lose the trust of your employees. And they're gonna to try to protect themselves or their coworkers, so they withhold information that you need to have an effective root cause analysis. And then there's always legal ramifications for unfairly blaming somebody. If you can't justify the discipline, you could have potential problems on your hands. So using the Taproot Dictionary and Tree, I created a checklist of questions that need to be answered before passing out discipline to eliminate risk. If you answer yes to all these questions based on evidence, you're proving that your organization is doing everything possible to support your employees. And if disciplining an employee is eventually where you do go, well then everyone understands why, including the employee. You create a culture where discipline is the last resort, and if discipline is necessary, you can show why. The documentation you create performing the taproot investigation or your investigation is your shield against legal action, possible union problems, and even cultural damage. So let's begin our checklist at the first near root cause on the tree. SPAC needs improvement. Now SPACs are standards, policies, administrative controls. These are the rules. So the first thing we're gonna even ask is, are these rules documented? Because if they're not documented, then it's a very easy for people not to follow them, but to make an excuse, oh, I didn't know. And if they are documented, we're going to ask, are they strict enough? Do people, are people misinterpreting the rules? So let's make sure those rules are strict enough so we're not seeing the problems that we might be seeing now. Do the people who have to follow these rules think the rules are easy to understand and specific enough? Ask our employees. And do our people think the SPAC is technically correct? Are they doing it their own way because they know that's the way the job needs to be done? So those are some questions to answer to decide if the rules that we've put in place are good enough. Do they need improvement? If we say yes, that's great, we're gonna move on. So sometimes people just disregard the rules. They don't even try to follow them. So if they're just disregarding, they're not using the rules, we're gonna ask ourselves, did we communicate these rules well? and make sure it was understood by all who must follow them. As a company, have we done that? If the SPAC was recently changed, do our people know about the change? Did we clearly communicate it? Do they understand what's expected? And a big one, are we enforcing the rules consistently and leveraging our knowledge of the enforcement spectrum and the motivators of human behavior to encourage compliance to the rules? And we're gonna talk about this a lot more in just a minute because this is a very, very important concept to help with ensuring people are motivated to follow rules. Then we're going to ask, is the SPAC implemented well, and is it practical to follow? Do people understand that they are accountable to these rules? And can we detect, as a company, can we tell when people aren't following them? Because if we can't tell, then we can't correct it when it happens. So again, if we say yes to all those questions, beautiful, we're doing everything we can. We have no system weaknesses that are allowing people through the cracks and to break the rules. Now the next near root cause we're gonna look at is oversight in our employee relations. Are we auditing? You know, are we, do we care enough as a company? Is this rule important? Do people have to follow this rule? And if it is, are we auditing it? Are we ensuring that they're doing it? And are these audits, are they designed specifically enough to detect any non-compliance to this particular SPAC that we see broken? And is the audit conducted by someone who is not the owner? So it's not easy just to pencil whip these audits and say, everybody's doing fine. And do, as a company, do we communicate why these rules are important to follow, that they know we want these rules. These rules are in place to make sure they go home to their families safe or that our products don't get damaged. And if, we are, if we're telling them, is it consistent? And do employees have a way to communicate concerns regarding these rules? And do we get prompt feedback when they do as a company? Again, these are potential weaknesses in your systems you wanna identify through this question checklist before you start punishing. And then the last couple questions we wanna ask is about our corrective action program. 
Have we already addressed the issue with this by these rules by implementing an effective corrective action that's worked up to now, but now it's not? We may have an issue. Do we adequately trend violations to this rule? So maybe it is a systemic issue that we need to fix. So that's quick and easy checklist. We're asking ourselves, we're answering those questions based on evidence that we've collected throughout our investigation. We want to make sure our findings are defensible, so we're only answering yes if we have evidence to prove it. All right, so I kind of gave away this answer a little bit ago, but what root cause shows up the most when we analyze why people didn't follow the rules? And I'll give you a hint. If you're familiar with Taproot, our corrective action helper has eight pages dedicated to this root cause. Survey says enforcement needs improvement. See, I gave it away a little bit ago. But how we enforce the rules are really, really important to the way people think. And I'll explain why. So how do we enforce them? Well, we want to enforce our policies and procedures by exercising control and influencing staff behavior. So the people who are responsible for the work want to do the work correctly. Common problems that you see out there is maybe the enforcement just lacks. Like sometimes we'll enforce the rules, sometimes we don't. It depends what's going on that day, how busy we are. Maybe it's failure to follow the policy goes uncorrected. Like we just, we don't think it's important as management or managers and maybe uh, we just don't do anything about it, or we've got bigger fish to fry. Uh, Noncompliance is accepted by the supervisions. Maybe we're not giving anybody any positive incentives for doing the right thing. And maybe, unintentionally, we're giving them positive incentives for violating policies. Maybe if they're taking shortcuts, they're getting longer breaks or, or something like that. Uh, maybe there's conflicting positive and negative incentives. And enforcement is seen inconsistent by staff. Because if people see that sometimes it's addressed, sometimes it's not, well, it's a little easier to take that chance and break the rule because chances are they might not get caught. Um, are people mostly rational? Uh, have you broken a rule today? I'm sure probably all of us have broken some kind of rule today. And if you have broken a rule, think about that rule. Was there a rational reason you did it? Probably so. I think a lot of times when we break rules, we do rationalize it. We, we will tell people it does make sense. What we did made sense. Of course, most of the time we don't make irrational decisions. Most of the time. So reasons for breaking the rules, what we tell ourselves is, man, this rule is really unnecessary. It's just burdensome. You know, these rules are just for the people that don't know what they're doing. I've been doing this for a long, long time. It's just for the inexperienced. Maybe I'm just going to break it once because I need to get the job done today. Maybe I consider them just guidelines because my company is lax in, a, in um, enforcing the rules. Or I see everybody else doing it. So that's my excuse for doing it. But this is good, right? This is very good. If people are rational, we can understand their behaviors by analyzing the positive and negative incentives that drive their behavior. We can analyze and introduce better incentives when we create corrective actions to help encourage the desired behaviors once we understand the enforcement spectrum. So the enforcement spectrum has a lot to do with the consequences and the way those consequences are handed out when people break rules. So if the consequence to rule breaking is late, it might happen, it might not happen, it's uncertain, and it's negative always, we can expect non-compliance. Now, if I break a rule and the consequence is very swift, and I know it's going to happen, and it's punishment, it's negative, I'm probably going to follow the rules. You can expect reluctant compliance. Now, if you get to the point where the consequences for uh, breaking rules or following rules, the consequences are soon, they're certain, and they're positive, well, then people are going to follow the rules. You can expect committed behaviors. So think about rules at your company. Maybe think about a rule that's often violated. Are the consequences or incentives, are they late for that breaking the rule? Are they uncertain? Do you always catch them doing it? And are they negative? If so, they're going to find reasons not to follow the policy. Now, if your consequences or incentives, once you find out somebody broke the rules, you know, there's swift reaction. Employees know that they're going to get punished for it even before they make the decision to follow the rule, and they are punished. Well, they're going to follow the rules because they have to. They don't want to get in trouble. 
not because they want to. And this is the fastest way to cause change, but your culture will suffer. Now, if you have incentives or consequences that are soon certain and positive, well then staff's gonna wanna follow policy and they're gonna find reasons to comply because they want that reward. Uh, this is most effective, but it does take some creativity and continued effort. I'll tell you, one of the um, stories I got in a class I taught was pretty powerful and it spoke to this. There was a manager that was telling me the story. He was in my course. Um, he said that he had an employee Every, every week he sits down, and for about 20 minutes on a Friday, he writes thank you cards. Like, he'll notice either good audit findings or, you know, people's behaviors, uh, people positive. Whatever he wants to encourage, whatever behaviors that he saw that week that he wants to encourage, he'll take out a thank you note, and he'll do a handwritten thank you note. But it wasn't to the employee. He would find out, you know, who the employee's spouse was, maybe the kids' names, and he would write it to the family. And he would say, hey, just wanted to let you know your dad's a superstar at our company. We couldn't get along without him. You should be very proud because we all are here. And he didn't give it to the employee. He sent it to the employee's home. So the family gets it. Uh, the guy said, the guy, the employee, came uh, back to work like the previous week and was like very, very thankful. And he told the story. He said, yeah, I got home. And if you have kids, you notice on the refrigerator, there's like a thousand things posted up on the refrigerator, paintings and school stuff. Well, he said that he came home and his kids are sitting there in front of the refrigerator, just you know, standing with a big smile on their face. And he's like, what is going on? And he looks in the refrigerator and that thank you card's there. And he said it made him very emotional. He was like, oh my gosh, my kids are proud of me. They, say, they see this, now I got something on the refrigerator. And that mean, meant more to him, he told his boss, that meant more to him than anything else he could have done, including giving him a bonus. Those memories, that recognition, they, they, they're with you forever. If you give somebody a monetary bonus, let's say he gave him a $50 gift card, you spend that money, a year later, you don't remember that, the money's gone. But you do remember how your kids looked at you when you walked in the door after getting something like that. So there is some creativity involved when you're trying to put together positive incentives, but it can be done. So incentives are motivators. Management should create incentives that motivate the staff to follow the rules. It's easier said than done, but it's not hard. We know the top four motivators of behavior. We are human performance experts here at Taproot. We know what motivates people. And anybody who's familiar with our training, they know this and they leverage this when they put together corrective actions. But the motivations of behavior are time. If it's gonna save you time, you're probably gonna do it. If it's gonna save you effort, you're definitely gonna do it. Now, the way companies enforce the rules will definitely help people make decisions either to follow them or not follow them. If you know you're gonna get caught and there's severe consequences for that, before you even break the rule, you've probably already decided you're gonna follow the rule. But if there is no enforcement to that rule, if there's no consequences, why would I not save time and effort by doing it my way? And there's usually other bonuses that you can find out. If you talk to the employee and you really, in uh, a way that helps them communicate with you, they'll probably tell you other reasons why they break the rule. There's some other bonus there that we need to understand. Um, just as an example, um, Saving time is a motivator for most things we do. Saving effort, again, makes sense in most cases so we can be more efficient with our time and save energy and get things done. Again, the method in which the positive or negative consequences are given will determine how employees react to the consequence. And then there's always additional bonuses, or mostly additional bonuses. Now the example I was gonna speak to, um, breaking the speed limit. That's probably something we all have done at some point in our lives right? So if we look at these motivators, why do we do that? Well, one of the motivators is time, right? We get to where we want to go faster because we drive faster. Um, it takes more effort to really know what the speed limit is than to just follow the car in front of you or drive down the road. I live outside Knoxville, Tennessee. We have two of the busiest, busiest interstates uh, in the U.S., combined on a stretch of 20 miles. And that speed limit changes like six times over those 20 miles. So it takes a little bit of effort to know exactly how fast you're supposed to be going in any length of, of highway. So it's a lot easier just to go. Enforcement. We know what the enforcement is. It's late, it's uncertain and negative. We rarely get caught. And if we even get caught, sometimes we get out with a warning. Uh, so the tickets, 
you know, they're late, they're uncertain, but they're always negative. Uh, the bonus we get for driving fast is maybe we fulfill the need of speed and we take care of Maverick, right? Wait, wrong Maverick. There's the Maverick that needs the speed. Um, some apps, some insurance companies are figuring this out. Uh, if you're giving positive feedback, if you're giving positive con consequences for following the rules, you know, I've seen commercials where the insurance apps, you can put it right on your phone and it'll give you feedback on how you're driving. And if you drive well, if you're not hitting your brakes hard or if you stay under the speed limit, then you get a percentage off your car insurance, right? That's a positive incentive. So as a, a driver, I know if that's apps on, if I break any of the rules, it's going to be known. I don't get my uh, discount, which is a certainty. And if I do follow the rules, I do get my discount. So that's positive. So those are soon certain positive. So they're starting to figure it out. Um, let's take a look at an example. Let's say in healthcare, we have a nurse who selects an override option to gain access to medication. Well, as we do our investigation, we know that's a mistake. She's not supposed to do that. So we find out it's typical that the automatic dispensing cabinets where they get this medication uh, is there to help people get the medication they need in an emergency when there's not an order for it. Um, management, this hospital was aware that uh, it has been a problem in the past because people are tempted to just use a shortcut, hit override, and pull the medication they need if they can't find it. So there's rules in place. Overrides are only to be used in emergent situations. Um, in this case, the medicine she needed couldn't be found because the cabinet was on a generic drug name setting in the search feature, and she was using the brand name. So when the override function was selected, there is a big box as a warning that says you should only use this for stat orders. Um, we found out the hospital's not doing live audits, but there are some tracking metrics, uh, but there's never anything done with them. So when the nurse was talking, she said she couldn't find Versed, the medicine she wanted under the patient's profile. Um, she starts typing in VE, which she hits override, which we know is not the right thing to do, but it's easier, so she hits override. We're not really watching for it. There's no consequences for doing it. Uh, and she types, starts typing in Versed, VE, and Vecroni comes up. But she was busy doing some other stuff. She was talking about a swallow study with an attendee and just pulls out the medication, grabs the wrong one. Now, we found out it's a common pro practice to use the override function when they can't find medication. So it's not just this nurse, it's all the nurses. And they acknowledged that it was, they knew it was against the rules, but you know, it was never a problem. They've been doing it for a while. So that's what we find out in our investigation. So now we wanna find out, well, what's motivating that behavior we don't want to see? Well, one of the motivations we see is that they can get the medication faster. Remember, it's not this one person. We're not just blaming the one person. We found out everybody's doing it. We're not gonna discipline one person when everybody's doing it. We're gonna find a way to, to make this better. So it does save them time. Now, it also saves them a lot of effort because if the medication they need is not in there, they're gonna have to go find out why and it's gonna be a big thing and healthcare is already so chaotic. It just, they don't wanna get behind schedule. So they take the path of least resistance, which is hitting the override because there's no real consequences for it. Everybody's doing it. So if management isn't doing anything about it, they almost condone that. So it's the way you can do it. And the bonus there, they said, was, hey, it helps us stay on schedule. We get to take care of our patients without getting further and further behind. So that's the old behavior. Now, what do we wanna see? On this new behavior, we wanna see them only using override in emergent situations. So now that we understand the problem in the situation because we investigated very thoroughly, you saw that, saw all that evidence that we collected on the previous slide, we know one of the problems was there was a generic name list and there was a brand name list. Why do we have two lists? That takes too much time to toggle between the lists and it makes it too hard. So we can save time and effort by just combining all the medications in one list. So my corrective action is gonna incorporate that strategy because I'm gonna save people time and effort doing it this way. And I should see less use of the override. Well, I'll definitely see less use of the override if I start enforcing the rules. 
So maybe I have somebody else sign off, put their name on it, make sure that people understand, look, if you sign this and we find out it's not right, here's the consequences for that. Make sure they know that before they even make the decision to break the rule. And to ensure that they know we're gonna catch it, we're gonna audit it. And any time that there is a problem, we're gonna address it quickly with the consequences we already described. But maybe we also introduce a positive incentive so we catch people doing things right. So if we do catch them doing right, maybe we give a raffle ticket. So the department or the individual has a chance to win something every month, every week, whatever it is. Maybe there's some kind of recognition that you're giving them. Remember, recognition goes a long way. So we're gonna use these time, effort, the way we enforce it, uh, whatever other bonus we can give them, we're gonna use those to help encourage the right behaviors. So as a takeaway, I know this is a recording, so I want you to just take some notes here. Here's an exercise you can do yourself or with your team to help you develop some strategies to help encourage the behaviors you want to see out of your employees. So think about what is the biggest challenge when it comes to non-behaviors? And you can even pause this to give you some time to talk and find out what is that rule that's being broken that's driving us nuts. And then Let's use the process we just went over to help find a way we can fix that. Be a hero. So you might want to take just a second and put this grid, write it out on a piece of paper, write down your motivators down one side of the um, page, time, effort, enforcement, bonus. And then up top, describe the behavior, the rule breaking behavior. What do you not want to see? What's happening right now? What is the rule being broken? Write that down. What are they doing? What's your employees doing? What rule are they breaking? And then talk to them or talk to people involved and find out, okay, you're breaking the rule. We get that. You know, nobody's in trouble at this point. But why are we doing it? Let's figure out why. How does it save you time? How does it save you effort? Look at how your company is enforcing it. Are we enforcing it well? Do we have system weaknesses that are allowing these behaviors to happen and we don't even know about it so we can't correct it or are we ignoring it? Find out how we're enforcing it. And then ask them, what else are they getting out of this? Because maybe we can work with that as well. And then you want to go and find out, what is the behavior you want to see out of your employees? How do they follow this rule? And let's document that. Let's, what's that new behavior? And then talk to everybody involved. With We want them to do it this way. How do we save them time? How do we save them effort? How do we make it easier for them to follow this rule? And as a company, what are we going to do to make sure people are following that rule? How are we monitoring it? So if they don't do it, we know it. And then we have very soon certain negative consequences for not following the rule. But then how do we catch people doing well? So when we follow up with them, when we're doing our audits, whatever it is that how we're monitoring it, when we catch people doing it the right way, what are we going to do? You know, how do we reward that? How do we ensure that these, these behaviors uh, continue. And then is there anything else we can do? And let's just check off. Are these all soon certain, soon certain positive? Are we using these motivators to help people make the right decision when it comes crunch time and they have to either decide to follow the rule or break it to get the job done? So this slide, if you want to take a look, this just same same directions that I just gave. Um, that might be helpful if you want to take a picture or if you just um, pause this as you go through the exercise. Uh, that'll help you get through it. And once you get that done, share it with your team, talk about it. And as a recap uh, for this talk, just want to make sure everybody understands when you refer your management teams to the management systems basic cause category, um, when somebody breaks the rule, those management systems as you go through these, they're not about individuals. They're not individual managers. It's about management systems. So if you're not familiar with Taproot and you start talking about management systems, make sure people understand we're not trying to blame managers. This is simply management systems. There's a weakness in your systems for whatever reason. Maybe you never faced this problem before, but now you are. Now's your opportunity to introduce a best practice or knowledge into those systems to help people follow the rules. Every investigation like this should lead to continuous improvement. You should be adding these best practices or adding knowledge 
every investigation. Uh, we're going to focus first on seizing the opportunity to improve your management systems to limit future risk and avoid dangers of quick discipline brings to your organization. And here's our opportunities to improve. Improve the effectiveness of your rules that were violated. Now that we recognize which ones were broken, now we can really focus the laser in our attention to fixing uh, the way we do this job. We can improve the usage of the rules by our people. We can improve our oversight and communication with our people regarding these rules. And we can improve how we track problems with these rules and how we fix those problems. Now, if you want to learn more about Taproot, it's pretty easy to do. We're all over social media. We, we are a training company. We have all kinds of training opportunities. And the RCA and investigation tools are second to none. Um, we do have a stopping human error course. And that's a lot like a little, this is just a little tidbit of that whole course. It's how do we leverage human performance knowledge to ensure our systems are set up to help people not make mistakes. But if they do make a mistake, the systems are strong enough to catch that mistake before we have an incident. So we have a two-day course coming up in October. This is 2022. Another opportunity is to attend our executive leadership course. We do that at the summit, or we can do that virtually for your organization at any time. Uh, we can also come on site and perform, perform a, uh, a leadership course so your leaders know how important it is to give you time to truly understand what's going on and help support you with the corrective actions that you come up with. And then we have a five-day Taproot Advanced Team Leader course, and that's designed for anybody who's in charge of major investigations. Uh, in that course, we teach the Taproot process, but we also teach other evidence collection techniques, uh, interviewing, you know, how do you interview people so that they're relaxed enough to give you the information? How do you encourage memory? Uh, we talk about critical human action profiling so we can understand, well, here's how we think the job should be done and is being done out there to here's how it's actually being done so we can find the discrepancies and fix them. We do change analysis. So there's a lot of good information. I promise you, if you attend the course, you'll come out better investigators, and you're going to have access to tools that's going to be able to take you beyond your own knowledge. You're going to have these human performance questions, equipment reliability questions that you can ask to really determine what happened and find those root causes of why it happened. We also have Corrective Action Helper that will give you those best ideas, uh, best practice ideas uh, to introduce into your system, how to improve your systems, we have a booklet for every root cause on the back of our tree. There are several ideas, best practices, references to help you build more impactful corrective action. So all that stress and anxiety is kind of taken away from the process. Um, you can always contact me at marcus at taproot.com for further questions or to get a demo of Taproot so you understand more of what we have to offer. Thank you for your time and I appreciate your attention.